Our dear brothers, sisters, friends and viewers, we, we greet you all in the wonderful and precious name of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the day the Lord has made. And we shall rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome once again to today's Bible study. As we delve deeper into the Word of God and trust that by the Holy Spirit we get unveiled to us what is contained into this wonderful book of Revelation. The revelation which God gave to us concerning his son Jesus Christ. As we get into today's session, let's dedicate this moment to God in prayer. Father, we thank you for your grace, for yes, your love, yes, for your peace, yes, for your mercy. We thank you, King of Glory, because you are at work in us. Mm -hmm. We yield our lives to you, Heavenly Father. Yes. Minister through us. Yes. Have your way in us, King of Glory. Yes. Let your word be amplified in the name of Jesus. Yes, Lord. Glorify your word today yes. that men might see it yes, and run towards it in the name of Jesus. Yes, Lord. We pledge after all is said and done mm -hmm. that the glory, the honor, the power and the worship is yours alone. In okay. Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So our viewers and listeners, we began last week with chapter 17. And I would like us to open again to chapter 17. And recap with the verses from verse 1 to verse 18 as we get back into the word of God to understand what the Spirit is saying to us in this time. Let's open our Bibles. Verse 1, the Bible begins. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bows came and talked with me saying to me come I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication and the inhabitants of the earth were drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast which was full of names of blasphemy. Having seven heads and ten horns, the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls. Having in her hand a golden cup, full of abomination and filthiness of her fornication. On her forehead, a name was written, Mystery, Chama. Babylon the Great, Babylon the mother of harlots, and of the abominations of the earth. I saw the woman, drunk with the blood of saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. But the angel said to me, Why did you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and the beast that carries her. 
which has seven heads and ten horns. The beast that you saw was and is not and will ascend out of the bottomless pit and go to perdition. And those who dwell on the earth will marvel. Whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. When they see the beast that was, and is not, and yet is, here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are the seven mountains on which the woman sits. There are also seven kings. Five have fallen. One is, and another has yet to come. And when he comes, he must continue a short time. The beast that was and is not he is himself also the eighth and is of the seven and is going to perdition. The ten horns which you saw are ten kings who have received no kingdoms as yet. But they receive authority they are of one mind and they will give their power and authority to the beast. They will make war with the lamb and the lamb will overcome them. For he is the Lord of lords and the king of kings. And those who are with him are called chosen and faithful. Then he said to me, The waters which you saw, where the harlot sits, are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. The ten horns which you saw on the beast, these will hurt the harlot and make her desolate and naked. Eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God has put it into their hearts to fulfill his purpose, to be of one mind, and to give their kingdom to the beast. Until the words of God are fulfilled, and the woman whom you saw is that great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. May the word of the Lord be blessed. We pick it up from where we left last week. Looking at something very profound as we try to unveil or to answer this question, who is this harlot? Who is this woman that is seated on the beast? Last week we began with five clues we try in over that will help us unveil who this woman is. And let's do a recap of those five. First we noted that she is called a harlot or a prostitute. This indicates worship gone wrong. It is a picture of unfaithfulness to God. A picture of someone 
who outwardly professes to honor and serve and worship God. Yet they don't do that. The second clue we saw concerning this woman is her universal influence. The Bible states that she sits on many waters. And in verse 15, the, the angel explains to John and us what the many waters represent. He states that the waters represent peoples. They represent multitudes. They represent nations and languages. We see in verses 1 and 2 that the, this woman causes the kings of the earth to commit adultery, to go into idolatry and worship that is not directed at God as the subject. Thirdly, the Bible tells us that she is seated on the beast. In other words, she is dominating the beast. The beast is under her control. Now we've understood that the beast is the person they call the Antichrist. But he not only represents the person of the Antichrist, but he also represents the kingdom that comes under his influence. Now, here we see that the woman will dominate the beast. In other words, he will have influence, total influence over the Antichrist and everything that is under the Antichrist's influence. But this exercise of dominion will be for a short time. Until what God has ordained in verse 16 and 17 is fulfilled. The Bible tells us that the beast and the ten horns which are kingdoms will hide her. They will bring her to ruin they will leave her naked. They will eat her flesh and burn her with fire, completely annihilating her. The fourth clue we see concerning this woman is that she is worthy. She is dressed expensively. And this is a tool to attract people. Those that will be attracted by her glitter and glamour and opulence. Those that will be drawn by her outward magnificence. The Bible says in her hand, which gives us the fifth clue, she has a cup that is of God. Again, this cup is a mimic of the cup of our Lord Jesus Christ. At the Last Supper, our Lord lifted up the cup and say this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Here we have a cup in the hand of this harlot. And on the outside, it is a golden cup which speaks of divinity. So there is a form of a goldiness. There is an appeal to divinity. 
But it is not what it looks like. The clothing of gold, the clothing of purple, tries to mimic God's loyalty. But it is not it. And here, we then get to the sixth clue. Why are we going driving into the clues? Why are we trying to help you understand all this? This comes from a personal testimony. When I first came to the Lord, for several years, I, I dwelt into the word of God. But also during that time, I did read a lot of commentaries. And these commentaries were very helpful to me in terms of understanding the word of God, in terms of getting the context and getting the expositions that these men and women of God had concerning several aspects of the word of God. However, to my dismay, I soon realized that sometimes these theologians try to be politically correct. Especially when they are dealing with contentious issues in the Bible. For instance, I would pick out today's text and take you back to one of the commentaries. And I want you to see you can't go back and pick the same reference and read it. But this is the comment that comes from the Expositor's Bible Commentary. In volume 12, on page 553 to 554, this is the, what the comment is there. It says, in an important sense, the interpretation of this chapter, which is chapter 17, controls the interpretation of the whole book of Revelation. For a majority of the exegetes, Babylon represents the city of Rome. The beasts stand for the Roman Empire as a whole. With its subject provinces and peoples. The seven hills that we see in verse 9 are the seven selected dynasties of the Roman emperors from Augustus to Domitian. The ten kings are heads of lesser and restless states eager to escape their enslavement from the colonizing power. John's prediction of the fall of Babylon is his announcement of the impending dissolution of the Roman Empire in all its aspects. Now, this may appear sincere. And you ask me, Pastor, what is wrong with this? Let me explain to you something. Verse 9 talks about the seven years. And talks, refers them to the seven dynasties of the Roman Empire. So they are talking about the Roman emperors from Augustus to Domitian. Now, the 
emperors from Augustus to Domitian were not 11. Katiba, I mean, were not 7. Bana abafuzo kutanira kwa Augusto paka ku Domitian, tebali kumusamfu. If you read history, these emperors were 11. You had Augustus Caesar as the first one. Then you had Tiberius. So after Tiberius, you had Caligula, who was the grandson of Tiberius. Then after you had Claudius. And after Claudius, you had Nero. After Nero, you had Galba, who was followed by Otho, who was followed by Vitellius, who was followed by Vespasian, who was followed by Titus, who was followed by Domitian. The question I ask, are those seven? Let's get back to the word of God. You see, though these scholars may appear sincere, they are sincerely wrong. And it is amazing to me how they seem either to be unwilling or unable to see the woman. Because the key character in verse 17, in chapter 17, the key person the Bible tries to unveil is the woman who sits on the beast. And this commentary completely ignores the woman. They talk about the horns. They talk about the beast. They talk about the hills. And they omit the woman. They are unwilling to talk about her. The modern day Babylon woman. Some versions try to cloud her into the beast. But the Bible is very clear. The Bible states that the woman is sitting on the beast. So the, the beast and the woman are two separate entities. And when you look at you look at the ten kings giving their authority to the beast. So which is separate, we don't see the woman giving any authority to the beast. We see the woman dominating the beast. So, so the woman cannot be sitting on the beast and be the beast at the same time. So let's pick up from where we left off and go to the sixth clue that we have given to us. And this is the name that is given to the woman. She is called Mystery Babylon the Great. The word mystery indicates that there is something deeper here that we see appearing on the surface. Babylon, of course, we understand was a great city that dominated its world at the time. And this city was on the river Euphrates. And we see this all the way going back to Genesis. That this was begun as the city of Babel. Which was founded by Nimrod. That great hunter of human souls. The one who bragged about killing men. 
And this city then became the source of great idolatry. For all that time. Now, this is not a reference to the Babylon of the Euphrates River. Because of the use of the word mystery. Mystery means it is deeper than what you see on the surface. So this points us to the spiritual aspect. So what they are saying is that this woman is comparable to Babylon spiritually. So it points to idolatry. It points to spiritual adultery. So why, so why am I saying that? We have seen previously in the book of Revelation chapter 11 and verse 8 when the Bible speaks concerning Jerusalem Jerusalem is called Sodom and Egypt. Now, Egypt and Sodom are different physically from Jerusalem. But from a spiritual perspective, at that time in the future, what will be happening in Jerusalem will be reminiscent of what happened in Egypt and what happened in Sodom combined. So the Lord by His Spirit then unveils to us that for you to understand what will happen, Jerusalem will be called Sodom and Egypt. Because of the wrong teachings, because of the corrupt influence, because of the idolatry that will be persistent in Jerusalem at that time. So when she is called, referring to this woman, when she is called the mystery Babylon the Great, the great, I told you, is the word mega. So it will be grand. It will be on proportion of scale that is unheard of in terms of its grandeur and size. But again, in terms of the immorality that will be there. The spiritual idolatry. It can only be comparable to Babylon. So we we'll go to the seventh clue. Concerning this woman. She is called the mother of harlots. In other words, when they talk about mother, that means there will be offsprings of her doctrine, offsprings of her errors. There will be offsprings of her idolatry. There will be offsprings of her false teaching that will spread out to every corner of the earth. There will be seeds sown that will go throughout the whole world. Many groups will align to her teaching. And that's why we should not fall for the fallacy that if you can't beat them, join them. You see, in the spiritual matters, the majority does not always mean it is right. Just because Many people have chosen to go that way. That does not make it right. Jesus says that broad is the way. 
that leads to eternal destruction. And he says, narrow is the gate. And narrow is the way that leads to eternal life. And there be few that find it. So I don't want you to be hoodwinked. Just because so many people are headed in a particular direction does not mean God is in it. No, God is where his word is. We need to go back to what God says and allow the Holy Spirit to order our footsteps. You see, a lot of people are following so many things because they make them feel good. They make them feel happy. They make them feel accepted. They, they make them feel they have a sense of belonging. But all that is of this world. Jesus says, what will it profit a man? After having gained this whole world, yet loses his soul. What will a man give in exchange for his soul? The eternal is more important than your present. So whatever you are looking at right now, we should look at it through the lens of eternity. Be it the work that we do, be it the company that we keep, be it the decisions that we make, whatever we are doing, we should ask what its impact will be in terms of eternity. And there we are looking at it in terms of what God says in his word. So here we see as a seventh clue that when this fails, this woman will use her influence and she will mother many people. So a lot of people will come under her umbrella. The eighth clue, the Bible says that she is the persecutor of true believers in Jesus Christ. This is what John saw. He says, I saw the woman. I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of those who bore testimony to Jesus. In other words, she is bent on murdering those that testify about Jesus Christ. She cannot tolerate authentic doctrine. She cannot tolerate anything that reveals what she says as false. She will oppose with violence and death anyone or anything that preaches what is contrary to what she is preaching. And we'll look at the two clues that appear elsewhere. One is in verse 9. The other is in verse 18 which is the last verse of the chapter. And these add to the confirmation of who this woman is. Verse 9, the Bible says that this calls for a mind with wisdom. That is to say, it is not something that is easily identifiable. 
bakuga nti kino si kyangu kuchirabana amaso go you require a mind of wisdom weta go moyo wa magezi and when we look at wisdom from the word of god tulaba magezi okusinzira mu kigambo kya katonda wisdom is the word of god amagezi kye kigambo kya katonda for the bible tells us and jesus says wisdom has said yesu yatugamba amagezi goge in other words god has spoken he is the fountain of wisdom. So it is only a mind that is stayed on the word of God that will be able to understand this. And he says the seven heads are the seven hills on which the woman sits. Now, more than very many writers have correctly pointed out and describe Rome as the city built on seven hills. So this is the same terminology that is used here. In verse 18, this is the revelation that comes to John. That the woman you saw is the great city that rules over the kings of the earth. That city in John's day could only be one city. Rome. And that great city was the capital of the Roman Empire. It dominated the world that John knew in his time. And at that time, the church in Rome was a genuine church. It was not a counterfeit. So at the time John was writing, this was a genuine assembly that was there. And this possibly explains verse 6 that when John saw the woman seated on the beast, he says, I was greatly astonished. Why? Was he surprised? Even the angel came and asked him, why are you surprised? Because in his day and time, everything pious, everything spiritual came from Rome. Now, transported in the spirit, what he sees greatly confounds him. He is so surprised that this is not what he thought it was. That Rome would become a great hallowed church dominating the kings of the earth. So having put all this together, we understand who this woman is. And she will ascend in authority. So the Bible notes in verse 6 that when John saw the woman seated on the beast, he says he was greatly astonished. He was in shock. Because what he expected his picture of what Rome represented and now being transported in the spirit. He sees the end from the beginning. He cannot believe that this is what it is all about. He cannot believe that the woman is who is actually being revealed to him at this point. Now, don't think this is personal. 
Actually, many scholars today agree that this is Rome. But go on to explain that this is pagan Rome that is persecuting the Christian church. John would not have been shocked at a pagan church or pagan Rome persecuting the church because that was to be expected. What shocked John was what he thought was authentic church was actually the one persecuting the church of Jesus Christ. That is where the shock comes in. That is where he is dumbfounded. That is where the angel comes in and asks, why is this shocking to you? I said, come, I'm going to show you what this represents. And we then have this clue. But I need to add a disclaimer here. When we talk about the church in Rome, we are not talking about the Roman Catholic people. I want you to separate the people from the church. Because even the church in Rome itself teaches that what they call the church is the papacy and its hierarchy. So separate it from the people. So what is interesting here, and I want you to see it, is that that's why it's when it comes to salvation, it is a personal thing. You believing in your heart the Lord Jesus and confessing him with your mouth. That is how you receive the righteousness that comes to us by grace through faith. So everything we receive we become children of God by faith. It, this is an act of grace that God has given to us. It is the love of God being sh shed to mankind that God came down as a child experienced everything we can ever experience. The hypocrisy, the guilt, the shame. He was lied on. He was misrepresented. He lay naked on the cross as a shame for all to see. Creation that he could he called into existence, subdued him to all the shame. Why? Because of you and I. When we place our faith in him, our guilt and shame is nailed to the cross. And we come into covenant with him. The Bible says in the text that we just read that when he comes, those that I will are with him, they shall be called chosen and faithful. So they will no longer be called who they were. Your failures will not count at this point in time. 
Even your fame will not count at this time. Your wealth will not count at this time. Neither will your poverty count. The great equalizer is the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says we will all be called chosen and faithful. That's a wonderful word of comfort. Now, where am I this all leading us? To you and I that are watching. Because next week we'll look at the third part of unmasking this woman. But where you sit and where I sit, we have a duty to perform. We have a role to execute. And this is to unveil Christ. You see, when Christ is revealed in us and through us, then people will be able to note that which is not Christ. So Christ in us, the Bible says, He is the hope of glory. And all creation is anxiously waiting for the manifestation of the true sons of God. The blessed hope which we can only receive when we place our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. So where does that leave you? Have you believed on the Lord Jesus? Because if you are not on his side, believe it or not, you are a candidate to follow the hypocrisy and the ideology of the harlot. And everything she represents. Everything the woman on the beast will represent. You are a candidate to follow that. But God does not desire that any perish. God desires that all should come to the knowledge of the truth. And that truth is none other than Jesus Christ. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He's not saying I'm one of the ways. He says I am the way. So if it is not Jesus, then you are not on the way. If it is not Jesus, then you don't have truth. If it is not Jesus, then you don't have truth. Life. So to you watching us today, this is your moment of reckoning. Is Jesus your personal Lord and Savior? If the answer is no, if you are not sure, today, right now, Jesus can come in your life. Your life will be holy and totally surrendered to him. And we will take a turn. You will now be referred to as the chosen. You will be referred to as the faithful. Why don't you pray with us? And say, Lord Jesus, today, I thank you for the word that has come my way. Lord, I ask, come in my life. I surrender totally and completely to you as Lord, that you become the Lord and the Savior of my life. Wash me with your blood. Cleanse and purify my heart. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. 
right my name in the book of life lord i thank you Help me by your Holy Spirit to be empowered to live the life that upholds you as Lord. The life that reveals you as King. The life that reveals you as the Messiah of the world. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. Amen. Amen. Now, for you who is already wonderfully saved, you have a journey to go to reveal Christ to lost humanity. You cannot be faithful unless you have lived faithfully with Christ as your Lord. So, if you are there, one way or the other, you have not been faithful. The mercy of God is still abounding to us. He says, if we say we sin not, we deceive ourselves. And the truth be not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Today, he can cleanse you. Today, He can renew your energy. Today, He can straighten those creeps in your life. Today, He can release you in a new wave, in a new way that men will see Christ and Christ revealed. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for that someone who is discouraged, for that someone on the verge of giving up, for that someone who is battling back and forth, swayed to and fro by cunningly crafted words of men. I pray, Holy Spirit, rekindle that fire in them that hunger for the truth, that desire to know you, that love for you, that desire to live for you. Help us, Lord. Together we will arise as an end time army that will shine forth in the darkness of our present time and draw many to you, Lord. Help us to live, not for ourselves, but to live for you. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord of glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now, for you that are watching us, for you that has given your life to Jesus Christ. There is that number on the screen. Please call. Somebody will pick it up and be an encouragement to you and give you the first steps in this journey of faith. For you that is born again, tell us what the Lord is doing to in your life and we will celebrate his goodness with you. So from Dominion Church, till we meet again next week, we say shalom. God richly bless you.